Hi everybody, my name is Ann. Thanks for joining me today on Art on the Creek. We are in my home studio in Parker, Colorado, and I am so happy that you're here with me today because I thought we could do some fun ink and wash of a beautiful sunset over Parker, Colorado. I just took this photo at the top of our hill and I've always wanted to paint it. So I think today's a good day. Are you ready? Let's go do it. Here it is. Here is the photo I took and I couldn't get over the orange and pink in that sky so thought we could definitely give it a go today. Um, I'm going to show you this in real time because I want to show you how I approach a drawing like this. First thing I'm going to do is put in the horizon line. Let me tell you a little bit about the supplies I'm using. This is just a click pencil from the school supply aisle and um, you'll see me pick up an eraser every now and then. That happens to be a Winsor & Newton art putty eraser I think they call it it's um, it's one of those uh, kneadable erasers I really like them and that little brush there on the side that is what I use to brush off erasure crumbs although I didn't need it I just kind of am in the habit of handing it nearby having it nearby so I'm just trying to get the horizon line in of that first ridge and I had to redo it a couple of times to get the angle just right because the mountain range disappears into the ridge there um, about on the, the right third of the, of the drawing. So I'm just going to go in and adjust these lines here every now and then and try and get this the way I want it. And then I like to start with some anchor points. So I think the first thing I'm going to do is draw the windmill. Um, the scene that you're looking at here is in our neighborhood. We live adjacent to, we, we butt up against ranch land. And I'm so sad to say that a lot of that ranch land is disappearing. However, where we are in Parker, we're lucky enough to be situated in a place where um, we have an awful lot of open space around us. And that's designated to stay that way by the state. Um, part of the Colorado Lottery, the funds go directly to open space. However, our neighborhood has purchased quite a bit of that open space land. And through this first field that you see here in the ridge, there are a lot of walking trails and they go back uh, behind that windmill and down into the valley. The gulch that's down there is called Tallman Gulch. Even though that is the closest creek to my house geographically, that's not the creek that Art on the Creek is named for. That creek is up in the mountains. And I think I've shared this story with you before. But my family came over from Italy to mine the mines up near Aspen, Colorado. My great-grandfather worked in the Paradise Mine and there is a creek up there named after him. Um, they bought some land on the other side of the, of the ridge and they named it Belodi Creek. So if you look on Google Maps, you will see that it is misspelled. <laughs> there is only one L. Uh, my family spells their name B-E-L-L-O-D-I, Belodi. Uh, but uh, somehow with the, the way that things get recorded, you know, and uh, back in the day, I don't think everyone really knew or cared how things were spelled. So a lot of times in record keeping, you know, things get uh, alter alternative spellings. So um, that's okay. We know that that was our great grandfather that started the cabin there. It's actually up near Newcastle, Colorado, which is close to Aspen. Um, of course, I think most of you know Aspen as a very glamorous, very wealthy ski area. But uh, when I was a child, it was it was a nice place to ski for sure. But it was just going up to the mountains. It wasn't that big of a deal. Um, not like it is now. But at any rate, uh, I digress. That's the creek anyway, Belody Creek. But we are painting the house on top of the ridge at uh, Tallman Gulch. And this house actually happens to be a business. It is Fika Coffee. And we love walking up here. This is just at the top of the hill at the end of our street. And you can sit on this beautiful patio and admire that wonderful view and enjoy a cup of coffee. Now the mountain ranges that you're seeing behind the the windmill there that is the Colorado Rockies and I want to say that that mountain is just to the right of Mount Evans as what you're seeing I don't think Mount Evans is in this picture I think these are the peaks that are just to the right of it before you get to the Indian Peaks Wilderness if you're heading north um, along that that front range so I love the view it's very familiar to me um, 
in the photo you can see most of the grasses are dry so this was taken in the winter time I believe um, not this year but a couple years ago and we have these wonderful sunsets and I just am so enamored with them and I'm amazed at how many colors you can find in the sky and with this set of da Vinci paints I will put a link in the description to my review I, I have to be honest with you I was a little underwhelmed and I'm kind of shocked because you know first swatching they're gorgeous they're absolutely beautiful and I thought okay well I love all these colors I love the paints maybe it's because of the way they're packaged you can see right above where I'm drawing that they have um, they're packaged in these little pans that are kind of a molded pressed paper and so of course when you get it wet over and over again the paper does kind of disintegrate um, and that's how they do their dot cards is in these little cases, which I thought was so clever and so cool. Um, I think I have 110 colors here. They have 120 in their whole line. And I'll put a link in the description to their website. For this particular painting, what I wanted to do was to really discover why these paints are so great. Because when I did the initial swatching, initial review, first of all, the swatching was fabulous and I was so excited. I wanted to just dive in and paint everything. But then when I kind of tested them out to do some painting, I was so underwhelmed. Oh my gosh, you guys, it was really shocking because I know that Da Vinci paints are very well loved and they're very high quality and I wanted to love them. But I think what it is, is in these paper containers, I cannot get different levels of wetness. I can either get them too thin or too dry. I can't get that in between consistency. You know how when you're painting, you want to have things either be the consistency of uh, a very watery consistency or skim milk or whole milk or yogurt. I couldn't get those variances in, uh, in thicknesses of paint and I really had a hard time controlling the water. So I really want to be fair. I mean, I, I have to say I am so impressionable. You know, you show me a rainbow of colors like this of all of these beautiful paints. I want every single one. I really do. And and you certainly don't need every single one. <laughs> Some of the colors are pretty close and you could really get by with uh, with just a selection and it's like Sophie's choice for me. It's so hard to choose which ones do I want. Well, I did try and narrow it down. Um I think I got it narrowed down to maybe 30. <laughs> but I'm trying to figure out which 12 I would choose for a palette because I think that these paints really need to be in a palette in a traditional type of watercolor palette so that you can re-wet them easily either that or using them straight from the tube of course um, so I wanted to give these a fair shot so that's why I decided I would do ink and wash because when you're using ink and wash at least when I do I have found that thinner washes are easier to use. Now if you are the kind of pa painter that likes to do many different kinds of glazes and keep those glazes very thin and transparent, um, which you know you could argue that's every single watercolor painter, but I like to use paint thickly sometimes, but at any rate um, if you are that kind of painter who really appreciates thin glazes then these paints um, I would say run, get yourself some because from the from the first impression of these they're beautiful and the, when they are transparent they are so beautifully transparent um, I found the pigments to be they say that they're richly pigmented and that's kind of a hard one for me because I am used to using Daniel Smith and M Graham and those pigments to me perform so beautifully I, I won't argue at all the Da Vinci paints are beautifully vibrant in their colors and uh, I think that they're they're clearly professional paints so you can you can just tell when you're using them that, that you're using something that's very high quality um, but as far as the richly pigmented goes again I think that was a factor of the packaging I think I just couldn't manipulate the level of water in the paints that I wanted so I was kind of stuck with a very sheer version of these pigments and maybe I'm just not used to that so I wanted to do this one to just give it a fair shot and actually I did enjoy it the problem that I had was mixing a black and I know that that's possible I know that you can mix a black with these paints I just had a hard time mixing it in these palettes and I did use a ceramic palette for a little bit but ultimately I kind of gave up and ended up using their lamp black which is a very nice black so I was happy that it was in there um, I'm just using a fine point sharpie. I'm not doing anything fancy here. I've just got this uh, ultra fine point sharpie and um, you know you can get them just about anywhere. Sometimes I just like to be real simple and uh, use these for line and wash especially if I'm going beforehand and this will give you a little bit of a more bold line. You can get one even finer than this I think. 
I'm not I'm not certain 100% but I do like uh, using these they don't work the best on all paper the paper that I'm using is 100% uh, cotton it is B watercolor paper and that is made by Royal Brush Company or excuse me Royal Manufacturing Royal and Lang, Lang Nickel it's kind of a, got a cult following I really like it it's affordable um, I, I got a pack of 50 of these sheets on Amazon. They're six inches by nine inches, which is just a perfect size for me. I like to make uh, small, fairly small uh, paintings and I like to do a lot of them. So this is a really nice size, really easy to carry a few sheets with you for plein air also. So these are, you know, really convenient to have and um, the Sharpie performs pretty well on here. Sometimes I found that some cotton watercolor papers uh, the sharpie just kind of gets caught on there and it's a little too absorbent and the ink has a tendency to feather so maybe if you have a fine point sharpie like this you might want to try it on paper that's not 100 percent cotton first or on um, one that maybe is not as high a grade of cotton i think it's arches paper is the one that i'm not as crazy about using uh, with this one or was it legion Maybe it was Legion. I'm sorry, I don't remember. But at any rate, different cotton papers will perform differently. Obviously, you have different grades of cotton when, when you're clothing. The same thing is true with, uh, with painting, with paper. Um, you're going to have different grades of cotton watercolor paper. That is why you can get into a cotton watercolor paper for a very approachable price um, because there are different grades of cotton and there are different processes in which uh, watercolor paper is made. So when you have a less of a hands-on uh, approach to your manufacturing or if you're using a lower grade of cotton, you know as an artist you may not notice the performance difference and you might be able to save some money. So look around. I am a huge advocate of 100% uh, cotton paper. In fact, this Saturday's review, I'm going to go over why cotton paper is so important. I, when I very first started watercolor, I was using wood pulp watercolor paper. In fact, I started with Canson XL. Um, I think just about everybody uses that paper to start with, and I, I was so frustrated. I thought, how do people like water? The watercolor. This is horrible. This is. You, you have all these uh, back runs and cauliflower blooms that you can't control. The paint just looks pale. And then someone suggested I try cotton watercolor paper. And lo and behold, <laughs> that made me feel a lot better because it made me realize that it just wasn't me. Um, so I do recommend cotton watercolor paper. Let's talk about the paints as I'm using each one. I have wet the sky and you'll notice I'm going right through the windmill. That is okay. Anytime you are trying to get a level horizon through an object that you know that you're going to be painting darker than what the sky is, typically that's what you're doing, um, go right through it because you can lift off some or it just won't even show up because you're putting a darker paint on top of it. So just remember that little tip. It will save you from having lines that start and stop in your horizon. The first color that I used for the sky there was manganese blue hue. And now I'm going in with their indigo and you'll notice their indigo has a tendency to lean teal. And that is, uh, it's quite lovely. It dries very different than, uh, than when it's wet. There's a big color shift. and. Uh, in my mind, it goes from that teal to a real beautiful denim blue. I mean, it's, it's a very nice indigo. So um, just now see here's how I lift off where the trees are a little bit and it does, it leaves a little bit behind and I knew that it would, but that's okay. I just wanted to lift up as much as I can where I was going to put those trees. And now let's go into uh, some of these beautiful oranges here. The one that I'm going to try first is Da Vinci Orange because I'd like to try some of their colors that are unique to their line. I got a little bit of uh, blue in there, so we need to dab that out. And let me rinse my brush quite thoroughly here, and then we'll go into this orange because it's such a beautiful, clear color. It's a PO73, uh, very nice pigment, uh, semi-opaque, which I really love. I love how it mixes with the indigo and creates a beautiful, natural sky gray. One thing I like doing with the skies here is in the wet on wet is to go ahead and mix different levels of water in because you can get some really neat backgrounds and cauliflowers that create kind of natural clouds. And I really enjoy doing that. Uh, I wanted to go in with a little bit more of a reddish in here, but I didn't want to use that cadmium scarlet because it is opaque. So I think I went into the vermilion and um, one of the colors that I really love. Uh, not much different from that uh, from the Da Vinci Orange, 
but that one, the Vermilion, is a PR-188 and a PO-62. Now I'm going into their Artemis. Now this is the same pigment formulation as Daniel Smith Moon Glow. Many of you would be familiar with that one. It's a three pigment paint. Um, it is transparent, semi-transparent, excuse me, and it is made up of PG-18, PB-29, and PR-177. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, that is a green, a blue, and an R, an R, a red, <laughs> sorry, uh, pigment green, pigment blue, and pigment red. That's what the PG, PB, and PR stand for. So at any rate, um, that one is really fun to use. It performs exactly like Moon Glow. It acts just like Moon Glow. But depending on where you live and how you access your art supplies, you know, the Da Vinci line might be more affordable to you. So check them out. I don't know if they work for you. That's great. I'm just in the process of testing them here. And I think that, like I've said, I've decided I do want to try a few of the tubes. I'm just going back in with that manganese blue mix, and that's a PB33 and a PB15, and it's also a transparent paint. Now let's see, I think I'm going to add a little bit of yellow for the sunset over here just to give it some, uh, some artistic effect here that I didn't take in the photo, but I'm using the Hansa Yellow Light, which is a PY43, and for that one I wanted to go ahead and get some yellow to where the sun is definitely going down and bring that up into the reflection of the sky. So that is a bit of an illustrative uh, uh, tactic, if you will, and um, I just wanted to add that. That's not necessarily in the photo, but I definitely wanted to add that in there. So you see I brought the sky into the house and now I'm blotting that off because otherwise that would have been a hard stop there. And I just wanted to make sure that the sky continued straight through. So I really like how the water acted on this paper. And again, it's to, no, no intention of my own. It was really just the the level of water that I had with these paints. Um, I knew that, uh, well, it, it had some, some level of intention, I should say. I knew that the wet on wet could, uh, could have these characteristics. But what I wanted to do here was just to make sure that I was getting uh, a little bit of variance in the water. And with these uh, paints, the way they're set up in these little sample palettes, that's really easy to do. And then I just went in along the edge of the mountain range there with some more of the orange. And now let's try and move some things around a little bit. I got a little bit of a squarish shape on that indigo back there by the house. So I'm just kind of blending it and feathering it out just a little. And that will give it a softer edge and make it look more like a dark gloomy cloud over there. And that worked out really well. I had no trouble with anything on the sunset here. I really enjoyed doing this part. And I will skip through the drying and we'll go to the next section. Now that the sky is done, I've got that main value down. That's really the star of the show here. I can work on the values of everything else. So I want to use this sea glass because it's such a really cool color. This one is a PB15-4 and a PG7. It's also transparent. Um, what I wanted to do was to mix this with their burnt umber. And their burnt umber here is a PBR7, which is also the same formulation as their raw umber. And that's not uncommon at all. They were burnt sienna is also a PBR7. It just depends on how that pigment is treated in the manufacturing process. So I wanted to get this very dark foresty green back here on this uh, far mountain range. And it's okay. I like it. I was hoping for something a little bit less green. But uh, this is the way it came out. So I'm trying to mix some more umber in there just to try and get it to shift a little. And again, because I can't really get a full, rich, thick version of this paint I wasn't able to really get this to the level that I wanted but no harm done I will stick with what we've got and we'll um, we'll add another glaze on top of it here at the end which is just fine so moving on to the trees I thought I would use that same sea glass and mix it with the burnt sienna again another version of the PBR7 but this time it just came out kind of a um, a really nice brown actually um, and you know, it's okay. It's not quite what I was looking for, but it kind of turned out to be a little bit of a surprise gift because that way I could layer on some uh, darker paint later and get the trees to even look better. So that turned out to be a surprise. So I'll go ahead and use this paint since I've got it mixed. I'll just use it for the roof because it'll certainly work. And I'm starting over on the left and just pulling everything toward the right because I think the, uh, the roof is just a little bit lighter on the right hand side. So I wanted to have just very subtle changes here. And it's kind of hard to, to really tell this, this part, whichever direction you paint the roof wouldn't be crucial. But I did want to give it just a little bit of a subtle difference the way that the, the sun is 
coming down and the way that the light is shining, I wanted to try and get this to look uh, a little more shapeful, shapely, uh, to have those angles show up. And I'm um, just trying to kind of put these shadows in here in the way that I wanted. And now it is time for the grass ridge in front. The dried grasses and our prairie grasses here on the high prairie are very much a yellow ochre. I use yellow ochre a lot and the one that uh, Da Vinci has is a semi-opaque version of PY43. I found it to be quite lovely. I would definitely um, add this yellow ochre to my palette, my arsenal. I would absolutely love it. And um, I think you will too. It's just a very nice, clear, easy to use yellow ochre. Didn't have any cloudiness with it at all. I really enjoyed this one. This is such a nice color. And let's see, now we're gonna go in and get some green on these grasses. And the one that I'm going to choose is Joyce's Mother Green. It's a mix of three different pigments, just like their, their Artemis. This one is PG7, PBR7, and PY42. It's a transparent, pigment and it ends up separating into those three different colors and it's amazing. It is one thing Da Vinci is I think known for is that they do collaborations with artists and this paint, the Joyce's Mother Green and Joyce's Mother Purple, both of those are made in collaboration with the artist, a watercolor artist, Joyce Hicks. If you ever get a chance to look her up, and actually um, the Da Vinci Paint Company website links to some of her videos, and you can see how she creates her beautiful moody paintings, but they've got such such a clear, vibrant light to them. I really love her work and um, these palettes that she has created. She's got a Mother Purple palette, or Mother Violet. Sorry, I don't want to get this wrong. Um, where are you, Joyce? Joyce's Mother Violet. She's got a Joyce's Mother Violet and a Joyce's Mother Green. Both of those come in uh, specific palettes that Da Vinci has curated. And uh, if you're at all interested, I think you will really, really be impressed. So Da Vinci does an awful lot. In fact, if many of you follow Doodle Washed, you'll know Charlie O'Shields. He is a wonderful, joyful man, and I love his whimsical art. He's very talented and very kind. Um, I've had a chance to just talk with him online a little bit, but he's just such a great guy. Uh, Charlie's paint is in here, that famous wonderful turquoise blue that he uses. It is Charlie O Blue and his paint, I haven't used it on this particular painting, but I definitely swatched it out uh, in the other video. It is a PB14, excuse me, PB154, a PG7, and a PW6. So with that PW6 in there, that is titanium white or Chinese white, depending on the formulation. So you're going to end up with a little bit more of a transparent, or excuse me, an opaque paint. Um, so it's really great. I really like Charlie o, Charlie o Blue. That's another fun one. They've got a lot of unique ones in here that uh, you just can't find in any other line. So I really do like that about the Da Vinci paints. So I'm going in with another green here, the Perylene Green, which is a PBK31, and I just love this green. If you paint anything having to do with forests or holly or um, any kind of pine, any of that dark, dark green, this paint you're going to absolutely love. In addition to this one, this is another one that I want for, uh, for a full tube of. This is a PR 101, believe it or not. It is Violet Iron Oxide. And oh my goodness, I love the Transparent Iron Oxide from M. Graham. But this one brings it into that purpley maroon moodiness. And I've just never really seen that before in a watercolor. And I just think it's the most fascinating color. It's also transparent, which is great. That's usually true of the iron oxides. Um, we have a place in Colorado called the Paint Mine Interpretive Park, and one of these days this summer I will take you down there and we'll do some plein air. When, when I start looking at some of these paints, it makes me think of locations around Colorado. So I really do want to take, um, I want to create myself a Da Vinci palette and take it out and try some plein air because I think, again, if these were squirted from a tube into a palette, I think that they would be easier to use easier for me. I don't mean that these are difficult to use. What I mean is that um, I'd be able to get different uh, different levels of thicknesses to the paints. So here I am just going in with a lamp black because I've uh, kind of given up on trying to mix a black with this uh, situation the way that I've got it with all these samples. Um, and theirs is a PBK6 and it is semi-transparent. It's a nice black. It really is. And usually lamp black when you use it can be kind of flat. This one isn't. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm going in 
in little strategic locations on these trees and I'm just depositing the pigment and then I will come back in with uh, just a wet brush and spread that around. So you will have some subtle uh, shape to these trees even though they are in, in very deep silhouette. And now we'll put a little bit of that on the roof and again I'm not going to fill it in solidly but I will put it in a few key locations and then I'll come in with a wet brush and just kind of spread that around. Um, this may be unconventional to go ahead and use the lamp black but as you have uh, have seen, I had some trouble mixing some black with these. And again, that's no fault of Da Vinci. I think it's just the way that these are packaged. So I'm very excited to get to the point where I can create that Da Vinci palette and uh, in the metal tin in a full pan palette and just really get these set up to where I can mix and enjoy them the way that these paints were meant to be enjoyed. As an introduction to their paints, this set is a really great thing to have and I'm very happy that I bought it. Um, it was pretty affordable too. Let me go into their website here and I will look at the watercolor samples and I will show you, let me look this up here, they've got some really great sample situations. This was only $29.95 for the sample dots of 110 Da Vinci watercolors and I will tell you these dots are generous. I've actually gone through a couple of them, but I've been able to do that on a lot of swatching and a couple of paintings. So you're given a good amount of paint and I really appreciate the ability to, to do that. Um, right now I'm using the Nickel Azo Yellow and that is a PY150. That is one of my favorite shades ever. I'm mixing it with some of my Holbein gouache because I wanted to get the rich gold but I wanted to turn it opaque for the siding on the on the farmhouse there on Fika Coffee. So I'm just adding that in and uh, trying to go around the windows as carefully as I can. And again, I'm painting over my uh, my lines that I did with my Sharpie. And the beauty of that is that you can just go back over the Sharpie and uh, bring that to the forefront again. So don't be afraid to just paint over something if you know that you're going to treat it later with something darker or lift it off or whatever. Don't feel that you have to be so detailed and get in between each and every little nook and cranny. Um, you can be a little more uh, generous with your strokes and uh, create that final look the way that you want it. All right, I've got that dry again with the heat tool and now we're going to go back into that Hansa Yellow Light, which is a PY43. It's semi-transparent and I'm just filling in some parts where I missed getting the sun. Um, trying to uh, make it not mix with the green, not mix and turn into green and just kind of give it a good layer of, uh, of golden glow there. And now we're going to go back into that violet iron oxide because again, love this color so much and it almost matches the trim on Fika Coffee House really beautifully. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and use this for the trim and the porch on the coffee house. And I just happen to have a little bit of it in the palette from uh, previous experiments. So I just used that ceramic palette there to kind of uh, agitate what was left there and pick that up as well. So we'll put the trim in using this Violet Iron Oxide. Again, that's a PR 101. I just love this paint. I've seriously gone through the whole little sample and um, I might be buying that one first. I don't know. I, their tubes come in three different sizes. You can get eight milliliter or 15 milliliter, which is uh, the standard watercolor tube size that you've probably seen everywhere. And they also have 37 milliliter tubes. And those, some of those were on sale right now for half price. So if you are at all shopping um, right now, meaning end of February when I'm filming this. So I don't know, I hope they're still discounted by the time you click on the link, but stay tuned and get on their mailing list because you can always uh, be notified of sales that way. I'm going over the ridge there with a little bit more yellow ochre and ultimately I will fill it in with some more of the Azo gold to reflect from the house but I wanted to give the ridge a little bit more shape and dimension here. So this portion is yellow ochre and I'm trying to go very lightly over these grasses but I did end up smudging them a little so I will go in and redo some of those grasses as well. And again that's just with the same greens and reds that we used before. Starting here with the Denise's Green, which is a PY129 and a PB60. That again is also semi-transparent and uh, Denise is none other than Denise Snowden. She is a very accomplished artist and she has collaborated with Da Vinci Paints to create an entire line of earth-friendly artist paints. They are wonderful and I really enjoy them. I enjoy her art very much as well. But that is a crave-worthy palette. Um, 
it is really fun. She's got a refill bundle pack too that uh, Da Vinci has created so that you can just stay in those colors and really, uh, really refill them and continue to use them. What I really like about their curated palettes is that they have a specific type of artist in mind for these curated palettes. You can get the primaries or you can get uh, autumn, you can get winter. I don't know what other seasons they have, but those are the two that are on the website at the time I'm making this video. And of course the, the Denise's Earth Friendly Da Vinci Watercolor Palette as well as her Embrace Opacity Palette. And they also have, um, of course, one that uh, Charlie O'Shields works to collaborate with them in addition to Scratch Made Journal. These are all artists that I respect and admire and I'm so excited to see a paint company working closely with artists to create tools for artists. So that gives them a lot of clout in my mind. Um, I highly recommend, like I said, signing up for their blog or newsletter, really checking things out and just staying in tune with, uh, with the Da Vinci Paint Company. I'm not being paid or compensated by Da Vinci. I'm just very impressed with their intention and their creation of paints. The one thing that I hesitate to fall in love with head over heels is um, these dots. <sighs> the way that they're packaged, I think, like I keep saying, is that it's just too difficult to get the water level the way I want it, but I've, it's got to be normal with a, with a palette. So in the future, I will try that. And we'll go on a field trip together to the paint mines and I'll take my Da Vinci paints and um, we can see what we come up with. If you've never been to Paint Mines Interpretive Park, it's phenomenal. I just, I just got to tell you guys, I can't wait to take you down there because it's, you wouldn't even believe it's there. This is the thing I love about historical sites and um, things that are set up to be uh, nature preserves and state parks and all that kind of thing. If, I, if you imagine back in the times of early man or Native Americans before the white settlers came west and you're just riding your horse along or walking along and you see this glorious feat of nature that you didn't even know was there, like the Grand Canyon. Can you imagine first laying your eyes on the Grand Canyon? You would be awestruck, absolutely awestruck. I am just constantly in awe of nature and everything that this world has to offer and I feel so fortunate and so blessed to be able to even just try to replicate it on paper. So that's my goal. I don't know. I kind of lose myself in that kind of thing, but uh, you might think I end up sounding like a broken record here, but I really just want to impart that same joy to you because, oh, if you just look around, the world is absolutely beautiful. It's more than there is on social media, I swear. <laughs> Uh, what I want to do now is talk about that nickel azo yellow. That's the PY150. I filled in the windows with that because it's such a nice luminescent glow of a yellow and it's perfect for bringing light from within to the outside. And I did go ahead and uh, pass a swath of that across the top of the ridge where the light would shine down on the grass from the house within. So now I'm going to go into more of this Artemis. I'm a little bit a little bit underwhelmed with what I've done with the mountain range there. So I'm going to try and add just a little bit more shadowy texture to it. And I thought this Artemis would be a good try. So I will go in and just kind of paint over the, the Rocky Mountain Range there. Not the, not the foothill, but the Rocky Mountain Range. And just try and get some more dimension. I'm not really looking for shapes because it's mostly in shadow. I just wanted to punch up the color a little bit and create a little bit more of a contrast between those Rockies back there and the grassiness of the foothills. So I did achieve that, I think. I think that turned out pretty good. And I also like how it made the trees come forward just a little bit more. Um, I hope that shows up in the monitor because I know these colors are really dark and um, however you're viewing it, it may not uh, show up as much, but maybe if you're painting along, you'll get the gist of what I mean and uh, you'll understand kind of how to replicate something like this. Of course, if you have a different way of doing it, by all means, you do you. I am so thrilled that art is just an expression of who we are. And I would be hurt if you thought that the only right way to do this was the way that I am doing it. I, I'm i not doing it the right way. I don't think anyone is. I don't think anyone can. If you have enough patience to be a photorealistic painter, number one, I applaud you incredibly. But um, your paint is going, your picture is going to look a lot different than mine. So no matter what your style is, celebrate that. That's who you are. It's painting is like handwriting. You can't expect to be exactly like someone else. So just enjoy what you've got and what you're able to do and continue to practice. That is the only thing you can do is continue to practice. 
One of the ways, if you wanted to critique yourself, one of the best things you can do is to take a photo of your painting. When you look at that painting through a photo, especially if you turn it to black and white, you will be able to see the way that other people see it. And when you take a photo of it and you decide that it's really the way you want it, then congratulations, you have succeeded. Um, and by turning it to black and white, you can really check your values and make sure that your contrasts are okay. So that's uh, another really good tip for you. Um, right now we're going in with a Jelly Roll pen. This is a 0.08, it's just a white. I wanted to catch some of the reflections because the sun hasn't gone down completely. So I kind of thought that maybe there would be some structures on the foothills there that might be reflecting some of the sunlight and a little bit on the, the right side of the trees and the windmill and maybe the ridge line of the, of the house there. Just wanted to pick up some of those key moments a little bit on the mountains back here too, where the sun would be reflecting off of those, uh, the, its last moments in the sky and the sun would just create those subtle little reflections. So that's what I'm doing here with the Jelly Roll pen and I actually kind of did this on a whim. I wasn't sure if it would even work, but I really like the way it turned out. So that was kind of a surprise to me and that's another thing I will always encourage you to do with your artwork is to Try something new. Try mixing your, your mediums. Try using some colored pencil or pastel pencil. Try throwing something else at it and see if you like it. Um, art is a way of experimenting and playing and having fun. And that is the one thing that you should always remember. When it stops being fun, that's when it's time to walk away and maybe try something else. So now it's time to take the tape off. This is my absolute favorite time of painting. <laughs> is the end. That doesn't say much, does it? But I really love seeing that white crisp border come. That's what I mean. So let me get the tape off of here and then we'll take a look at what we've got. Well, I have to say, I'm pretty pleased with the way this came out. The Da Vinci paints performed absolutely perfectly on this little ink and wash. And I think uh, once I have them in pans and I'm able to use them the way that I am accustomed to using watercolor, that I will enjoy them even that much more. So yeah, I definitely can recommend the Da Vinci paints. And I really look forward to building a whole palette of these because uh, I think they have a lot to offer and I'm anxious to try them in true palette form rather than just from the dot card here. Thanks so much for hanging out with me today, guys. The link to this reference photo will be below in the description and uh, that link is from Dropbox. So let me know in the comments if you're having any issues accessing that link and I will do what I can to help you. I hope everyone's having a great day and I hope you've got some lovely sunsets in your own area to paint. If you don't, come to Colorado. We've got plenty to spare. <laughs> Take care, guys. Have a great day.